thank you very much for the introduction. Great to be here. Uh, I am. Uh, actually, it's the, I, I, it dawned on me, it's the first time I've been here. I thought I, was, I had been here before to Ottawa. I've been to a number of uh, cities in Canada, but uh, this is actually the first for me. And uh, so I, I enjoyed walking around the parliament area and uh, seeing a lot of lovely spots in the city. So, uh, so it's been a, a, a delightful first impression. And uh, looking forward to engaging with you all on some uh, important topics. I'm going to move uh, very quickly with unperturbed her pace, deliberate speed, and majestic instancy. So uh, hang with me as we uh, talk about miracles. Uh, you may be familiar with Richard Dawkins, the atheist, uh, who says about miracles that events that we commonly call miracles are not supernatural, but are part of a spectrum of more or less improbable natural events. A miracle, in other words, if it occurs at all, is a tremendous stroke of luck. Is that all miracles are, a stroke of luck? Well, I'd like to, first of all, talk about a couple of miracles uh, and talk about two worldviews first, and then we'll unpack a few questions. Uh, so here's one story, and you see a couple of guys in that picture, uh, Ben Greco uh, there in the headband and the bandana, and my son Peter, the blonde there. My, they went as part of a uh, Palm Beach Atlantic University missions team, a team uh, I, I teach at Palm Beach Atlantic University. And so Ben Greco was the team leader of this group in Delhi. And there was a man whose body could probably be described as someone who had cerebral palsy, uh, twisted in the shape of a pretzel. He could not move around at all. Uh, he had to be moved from place to place. Ben Greco, the team leader, and a number of my students were also there on that missions uh, team, so you can talk to them. Uh, and, and, but but Ben, the pa there was a pastor, Indigit, who told him to pray for this man. And so Ben puts his hands on this man, starts to pray for him in the name of Jesus. And while he is praying for this man, he feels the bones in his back aligning themselves, moving into place so that by the time that he is done praying for him, this man is walking and leaping like right out of the book of Acts as we've just heard of these miracle stories. That's one story. Let me tell a little bit more. I, actually, oh, I didn't realize these were floaters uh, uh, pictures. Uh, let me tell you about another one that's actually a book. It's in a, found in a book by Craig Keener, a noted New Testament scholar who does rigorous uh, research. Uh, and he tells this story about a Vietnam veteran, Carl Cockrell, on March 2006. He, uh, he was after a, a spiritual retreat in Branson, Missouri. He felt this incredible pain in his ankle, and he fainted. He was x-rayed in the emergency room in Branson, and the doctor noted a serious break, uh, ordered that he stay overnight before the orthopedist set it in place. And this is how the story continues. Let me read it for you. It says, during that night, though Carl, uh, though Carl recounts that he experienced a voice from the Lord assuring him that his foot was not broken. After putting Carl's foot into a cast and warning that he would need months of therapy, the doctor referred him to his family physician. Carl's wife drove them back to Michigan, and the next day, his family doctor sent him to the hospital for some more x-rays. After receiving the x-rays, his doctor called him into the office and explained that there were no breaks or even tissue indicating where the break had been. You never had a broken ankle, the doctor explained. Carl pointed to the, the x-rays from Missouri. That is a broken ankle, the doctor admitted. But now there was no sign that there had even, there, that there had even been one. Uh, and so the doctor removed the cast right away. Carl provided me, Craig Keener, with the radiology reports from before and after the healing, supporting his claim. And again, this book, Miracles, is full of that kind of documentation and those sorts of stories. But this brings us to a clash of worldviews, doesn't it? Naturalism or theism? Well, what is naturalism? Naturalism has these three features, and again, I'm not stereotype or anything. This is just basic, uh, you know, a summary of the, 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 the main pillars of naturalism. First of all, metaphysics. Matter is all the reality that there is, or materialism. When it comes to etiology or causation, determinism. You can predict everything going back to the Big Bang from t up to today. Everything is predictable based on what has preceded so that things could not be different than what they are. And then, of course, knowledge or epistemology, that knowledge is acquired through science, a view called scientism, that only science or possibly uh, science best gives us knowledge. 
In contrast, theism. What is theism? That a personal God exists who is intrinsically good, immensely powerful, intelligent, self-existent. And that this God creates a world distinct from himself and creates human beings in the divine image with dignity and worth. And so in, in what I want to say tonight, it, biblical theism, I would argue, offers us a context for making sense of miraculous events from the Big Bang to Jesus' bodily resurrection. And unlike naturalism, it actually offers an explanation for key features of the universe and of human experience without undermining science. Now let me unpack some questions here that are often kind of revolving around that are commonly asked about miracles. Well, what is a miracle? Well, miracles are direct acts of a personal God or supernatural agent that can't be predicted or explained by merely natural causes or processes. In other words, miracles would not take place if simply left up to these natural processes. So naturally, water doesn't turn into wine. Uh, dead people don't live again after three days. Though impossible according to natural processes, such events are possible because a divine personal agent exists. The philosopher Alvin Plantinga, uh, we'll come to him in a moment, but, but he brings together something. We can talk about certain processes that God puts into place, intricate laws and amazing processes, or ordinary providence is sometimes called by theologians. This isn't opposed to God's acting directly in the world. For example, like a professor who cancels a class, even though he's been predictably regular about coming to his classes every day. What if he cancels? Does that somehow throw off the cosmos that there is no regularity anymore? No. Uh, that's, you know, there, there is a prerogative that he can act in that way. Similarly with God. God can act on the world that he's created. He can act uh, you know, stepping in, uh, in, in in unique ways uh, and he doesn't have to follow those uh, laws that he has put into place. In fact, God could use natural processes to bring about his purposes. Think about the evolution of the universe, the development of the universe over billions of years. Or some might even argue uh, through uh, biological organisms or you know, evolutionary creationism or theistic evolution. Uh, Alvin Plantinga says that the problem is not evolution per se, but undirected or naturalistic evolution. Now, I don't wanna get into a whole discussion here, but I'm just saying that why couldn't God use the evolutionary process to bring about his purposes if he so chose? Again, it's a matter of looking at the facts. What do the facts actually support? Uh, but, but again, it's not as though these are intrinsically uh, uh, conflicting with one another. Here's another question. Aren't miracles violations of natural laws? And David Hume, a Scottish skeptic, uh, died in uh, 1776, uh, made this claim. Now the problem with this is that David Hume is begging the question, that is he's assuming what he wants to prove. That is from the outset he's ruling out the very possibility of the miraculous. It's kind of ironic though that David Hume, who uh, formulated this problem of induction, he basically said yes, natural laws operate in a certain way, but it's not as though the sun has to rise tomorrow of necessity. You know, it, it, it's, it's possible that the sun may not, and so we have to kind of wait and see what will happen. Well, why could we apply that to miracles? Why don't we just wait and see if a miracle will happen? So, so his notion of the violation of the laws of nature on the one hand and the problem of induction, uh, these, these are actually in conflict with one another. It's kind of humorous. But anyway, belief in miracles assumes that unless a supernatural agent acts in the world, then yes, these predictable natural processes will continue. So, so again, it's not as though these are somehow uh, a problem if we, if we act, believe in a, a person, uh, or an agent who, who acts on the world. It's not as though it throws off even science, which brings us to the next question. How can we scientifically prove a miracle? Well, this raises some interesting uh, assumptions, doesn't it? Why think that science is the sole source of knowledge? That is scientism, but not science. Science allows, you know, again, it's just a study of the natural world, but there may be other ways in which we come to know things as well, whether it be through philosophy or ethics or special revelation, aesthetics or the study of art and beauty, uh, psychology. The person who says, how can you scientifically prove it is presupposing that only science can give us knowledge. But the problem with that is, how can you scientifically prove that all knowledge requires scientific proof? That itself becomes self-contradictory. 
You see, that assumption itself is not a, the result of scientific research, but rather it's a philosophical presupposition. And think about this. If you're only operating on the basis of what science can prove, it will strip you of your humanity. All those things that we consider valuable, the things that make us robustly human, are stripped away if we live according to a mere scientific, or I would say scientistic view, or as the PowerPoint says, a scientistic view view uh, of reality. <clears throat> but what about purpose? What about meaning? What about human dignity and worth? We talk about human rights all the time. Free will, personal responsibility, ethics, duties. Science doesn't tell us right and wrong. How do, it doesn't tell us what, what ought to be. Science only tells us about what is. What about moral character? What about loving relationships? Even the reality of evil presupposes a standard, that there is a departure from the way things ought to be. If we're only relying on science, it is gonna strip us of what makes life meaningful, what defines us as human beings. Historically, furthermore, theism and science have been allies. Think of all the pillars of, of, of the founding of, of modern science. These are ones who were Bible-believing Christians. Uh, you know, Galileo, Copernicus, Faraday, and so forth. We have, you know, again, we have very, you know, these, you know, Paul Davies, a science writer uh, and a physicist, says science began as an outgrowth of theology, and all scientists, whether atheists or theists, accept an essentially theological worldview. Rodney Stark at Baylor University, a sociologist, says the roots of science have rested in entirely on religious foundations, and the people who brought it about were devout Christians. So from the very beginning, science and the Christian faith were not at all opposed to one another. In fact, the Christian faith gave rise to modern science and its presumptions. I'm gonna skip this here. Uh, let me just move on to another point. Aren't those people who believe in miracles somehow ignorant and barbarous people? David Hume used that objection. Interestingly, what David Hume meant by ignorant and barbarous peoples was non-whites, a very racist uh, sort of a statement. Uh, people he believed to be naturally inferior. But when you read the Bible, you don't see people who are just gullible and they just take people, uh, just swallow whatever they hear. No, there's a lot of skepticism. There's a lot of doubting. Uh, think of Zacharias' doubt when his elderly wife Elizabeth, you know, when he was told that she would bear a child, you know, John the Baptist. Uh, Joseph was skeptical about you know, Mary's virginal conception being supernaturally bestowed. Uh, Thomas doubted Jesus' resurrection. When Jesus' disciples heard the women's report about Jesus' resurrection, they considered it nonsense. Again, over and over again, you see people questioning miracles in the Bible. Uh, it's not as though they're just uh, following, following along and saying, yeah, this must have happened and, and, and very easily swayed. Think furthermore about this. Uh, in this article by the sociologist Elaine Howard Eklund, What Scientists Think About Religion, in the survey of 1,700 natural and social scientists surveyed between 2005 to 2008, nearly 50% of academic scientists have a religious identity though they tend to be silent and for various reasons keep their faith a secret. And even of the 30% who identified themselves as atheists, one-fifth of them consider themselves spiritual atheists, whatever that may mean, but very interesting. And, and, and Eklund concludes that it's probably because there's maybe pressure, maybe people are uh, pushed into a silence because of the, uh, the, the naturalistic sway in the academy that they don't speak up about faith and, uh, and science being compatible. Uh, so, so again, but it's not as though people are just gullible. I mean, 50% of scientists, uh, you know, having a, this kind of very religious identity, she says. Here's something worth considering, Thomas Nagel. I like to quote him uh, in his book, The Last Word. He, he is, again, a well-recognized philosopher. He says, I speak from experience being strongly subject to this fear of religion myself. I want atheism to be true and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. And then he goes on to say, it isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief, it's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want a universe to be like that. 
But notice how he himself says that he is, he recognizes that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people he knows are religious believers. So gullible uh, doesn't quite fit. Aren't miracles merely God of the gaps explanations? Doesn't God just fill in the gaps of our ignorance until science shows that God is irrelevant? Well, actually, appealing to miracles should be based on proper philosophical and theological reasons and not on ignorance. Somebody who says, oh, I don't know how that, you know, that thing exploded, uh, therefore God must have done it. No, no, it doesn't work like that. Furthermore, we can talk about significant features of the universe, uh, its beginning, the biofriendliness of the universe, the fine tuning of the universe for life, and first life itself, as well as Jesus' bodily resurrection as a historical fact. These would fit into the category of miracles that aren't uh, susceptible to God of the gaps explanations. In fact, two of the 20th century's greatest scientific discoveries, the Big Bang and the discovery of the delicately balanced cosmic constants that make life possible, of course, that doesn't guarantee that life will emerge, but that life is possible, uh, actually invite God to fill the explanatory gap. Indeed, the Big Bang itself, the universe began to exist 13.8 billion years ago. Matter, energy, space, and time coming, to ex coming into existence. There is a cosmic miracle. And so if it's possible for God to bring a universe into being out of nothing a finite time ago, well, what's wrong, what's, what's the problem with the resurrection? What's, the, what's wrong with the virginal conception of Mary and so forth? Paul Davies says this, what caused the Big Bang? One might consider some supernatural force, some agency beyond space and time as being responsible for the Big Bang or might prefer to regard the Big Bang as an event without a cause. It seems to me that we don't have too much choice, either something outside of the physical world or an event without a cause. So unless you believe that something can pop into existence uncaused out of nothing, it seems to make sense that being must, you know, that being comes from being. Some people say, well, where did that being come from? Well, there's nothing self-contradictory with the universe's being, or sorry, with God's being self-existent. In fact, 200 years ago, atheists would say, the universe doesn't need an explanation, it's just there, and that's all. But now that we know the universe began to exist, people are saying, oh, if God made the universe, who made God? Well, again, it's a kind of a silly question. But again, there's nothing inherently contradictory with the notion that something could be eternally existent. In fact, unless you believe that something can pop into existence uncaused out of nothing, you'll have to believe that something had to have been there in order to produce the universe. So we were looking at something like God, and hence a miracle. Many naturalists complain about the God of the gaps, but they themselves are guilty of an opposite and equal reaction, a naturalism of the gaps. They assume that one day science is gonna give us the answer to our questions. And often they'll chide believers saying, that, you know, don't put your trust in science that seems to suggest that God exists like the Big Bang or the fine tuning of the universe. Things can change and so forth, but yet they're so firmly committed to science and they're using science against God, but when science is used in favor of God, they poo-poo it or say, diminish it or say it's unstable or something like that. So the naturalism of the gap seems to imply so great a confidence in scientism that ultimately no evidence for God could ever emerge. Well, this brings us to another issue. Is there evidence for biblical miracles like Jesus' resurrection? A lot of times, the Bible itself appeals to signs and wonders as legitimate grounds for belief in God or Jesus. These signs are written, uh, John says, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life through his name. Sometimes signs and wonders are mentioned even incidentally, taken for granted in historical letters that all Paul, that for example, all scholars will assume Paul wrote, like the letter to the Galatians. And Paul talks about, very kind of matter-of-factly, about the miracles that you saw worked among you. Now people say, oh no, they weren't. No, he's just appealing to things that they took for granted, things that they saw that happened. Or even the Corinthians, uh, the sign of a true, signs of true apostles performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. These things, you've seen them happen. You know what I'm talking about, Paul is saying. When it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, there are four widely accepted historical facts. That Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the discovery of Jesus' empty tomb, by his women followers, post-mortem appearances to the disciples, and again, whether those are hallucinations or uh, the actual resurrection, bodily resurrection of Jesus, that's irrelevant for the moment. And then the origin of the earliest disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection, the sudden emergence of the early church. Plus, we can talk about two conversions, Paul's and James' conversions, also recognized as historical facts. Now, notice that these aren't 
miraculous facts, as though you have to believe in the supernatural or something. No, these are facts that historians take for granted. The question then becomes, which explanation does a better job of accounting for those facts that historians take for granted? Is it a supernaturalistic explanation or a naturalistic one? If somebody will say, oh, the disciples, they believe that Jesus appeared to them, but they're just hallucinating. Well, we can ask the question, the tomb is still empty. <laughs> the enemies even believe the tomb was empty. How do you account for the empty tomb? That still isn't factored into that hallucination hypothesis. Well, remember this too, 1 Corinthians 15 says that Jesus' resurrection is historically checkable and in principle falsifiable. No historian doubts that Paul wrote this letter. In 1 Corinthians 15 it says this, for I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received. Paul's talking about a very early tradition uh, within the Christian church uh, starting shortly after the resurrection of Jesus itself. That Jesus died, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, to Peter, and to the 12, technically 11, but that was their, their name. Uh, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time most of whom are still alive. In other words, you can go ask them if you want. They saw him. And then he appeared to James, that is, someone who, Jesus' half-brother, who didn't believe in him during his earthly ministry. John 7 says even his own brothers didn't believe in him. And then to all the apostles, and last of all, as what to one untimely born, he appeared to me. And Paul talks about his being a persecutor of the church, but yet this confrontation changed him. Now, if Christ, he says, has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. If Jesus has not, if he has not been raised, you still are in your sins. And if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. So notice the objectivity here. There are eyewitnesses being appealed to. It's not as though just believe me, take my word for it. No, there are people you could check this out with. Now some people say, oh, but you've got to have extraordinary evidence to support those extraordinary claims that you make. Well, is that really the case? Well, let's talk about it. When people say extraordinary evidence, we're not often told what that means. An additional miracle delivered to the person demanding it? And what if God's existence and self-revelation offer the explanatory theological and religious background information to render plausible miracles like the resurrection? For example, Jesus predicting that he would be raised on the third day, repeatedly saying this. Well, you've got a context for this when the tomb is actually empty. Oh, maybe, oh, that's what Jesus said. Also, we may, not, we may just need additional evidence, like in the case of Carl Cockrell, the Vietnam vet, whose leg, his ankle had been broken. Maybe we just need a second x-ray but not necessarily anything extraordinary. That second x-ray wasn't extraordinary, but it was a pretty solid piece of evidence, wasn't it? Also, the extraordinary evidence claim is simply false. If you consider the evidence for the resurrection, the empty tomb, the purported appearances, the sudden emergence of the church, the conversions of James and Paul, the sudden boldness of the disciples, just ask, what is the more likely scenario given the evidence that Jesus did or did not rise from the dead? You see, we just wouldn't have this kind of evidence had Jesus' resurrection not occurred. Having all of this evidence is highly improbable if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. In fact, uh, the, not a Christian by any means, John Stuart Mill uh, said this same sort of thing. He says, to know whether a coincidence does or does not require more evidence to render it credible than an ordinary event, we must estimate afresh what is the probability that the given testimony would have been delivered in that instance, supposing the fact which it asserts not to be true. Some of you might be asking, well, that's nice you're talking about all these miracles. Why doesn't God show me this miracle? Well, remember this, in the scriptures, miracles don't guarantee belief. The Bible is full of miraculous events that are routinely forgotten or ignored altogether. For example, Israel in Egypt and in the wilderness. Or worse, some might even try to suppress the evidence, like when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead after he'd been in the tomb for four days, and Jesus' enemies, the chief priests, tried to put Lazarus to death as well as Jesus. So here they are trying to kill the resurrected uh, or the raised, the resuscitated Lazarus in addition to Jesus. Furthermore, God resists performing miracles for entertainment value. He desires, first of all, to, for us to earnestly seek him. You see, God isn't interested in some justified true belief that he exists. I mean, James 2, 19 says, well, the demons also believe and tremble. That's not good enough. 
but are humbly embracing him as the good, just, loving, cosmic authority who has our ultimate well-being in mind. James 4, 6 reminds us God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, we can talk about you know, evidence there. If you want to take a look at some of these books that we've explored, uh, you know, fine. But let me just appeal to the testimony of Anthony, Anthony Kenny, or sorry, Anthony Flew. Uh, there's an Anthony Kenny at, at Oxford University, but Anthony Flew, who had been the world's leading atheist for, for decades. But he changed his mind in light of the fact of recent scientific discoveries, the beginning of the universe, the design of the universe, the complexity of biological life. And so he, he, he authored a book that there is a God. And even on the resurrection, he, in a, con, in a, in a colloquium with uh, N.T. Wright, who is a Christian uh, New Testament scholar, uh, he says, I am very much impressed with Bishop N.T. Wright's approach, which is absolutely fresh. He presents the case for Christianity as something new for the first time. It is absolutely wonderful, absolutely radical and very powerful. Flew, though he didn't become a Christian, he affirmed the openness to any further revelation of God asking, is it possible that there has been or can be divine revelation? And he at least sees the, the claim concerning the resurrection as more impressive than any other you know, miracle claim uh, by religious competition. So the conclusion that I'd like to point out here is this. There are good reasons for a personal God's existence, which then would make room for the possibility of miracles. Theism makes better sense of the world and human experience. When you look at consciousness, consciousness emerging from non-conscious matter, beauty emerging from molecules in motion, rationality, again, from these uh, non-rational processes, free will from these deterministic processes, personhood from impersonal matter, language, first life, even, even dealing with issues like shame and the fear of death and guilt and our human significance and the search for security. What about dignity and worth, about moral duties, about the notion of information, the universe's beginning and fine tuning. You see, theism is properly prepared to offer a context for these things. But if naturalism is the case, it's hard to make this sort of a context for this. In fact, naturalists themselves, I have written, I wrote an article called The Naturalists Are Declaring the Glory of God, in which I cite only naturalists to make my case for God's existence because they recognize the inadequacy of naturalism to account for these various features of the universe as well as human experience. So there is historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection. A good case can be made for the credibility of miracles both in scripture and in history as well as today. And so I'd encourage you to take a look at these books by Craig Keener and a friend of mine, J.P. Moreland, a noted Christian philosopher in the last chapter of his book, Kingdom Triangle. When it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, I think Yaroslav Pelikan is actually, actually uh, right on the money. He says, if Christ is risen, then nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, then nothing else matters. Something for you to think about. Thanks very much for listening.